Hello and welcome back to this uh, lecture 32 on uh, bio microelectromechanical systems. Uh, Let us uh, quickly review what had been done last time. We talked about the, uh, the principles of micro mixing and uh, diffusion driven kinetics. I uh, will just like to reiterate that in the micro scale mixing really is a diffusional phenomena. Uh, there is no as such other mass transport except intermolecular diffusion. Uh, and so therefore, diffusion time and residence time and their comparison becomes a very important criteria for uh, establishing proper mixing. We talked about active and passive micro mixers. Active mixers, uh, if you may recall, are uh, essentially those mixers where energy is being supplied externally by uh, mechanical or non-mechanical means. And passive mixers are pure mixing by intelligent design where uh, you can actually split the flows apart many times and join them back so that they form laminae and that way you reduce uh, the interdiffusion length between the different mixing layers uh, and so therefore the time of reduction, uh, diffusion can be reduced uh, in this manner and taken much much below the residence time so that uh, there is mixing uh, till and until the flows reside in the chip and by the time it gets out they are totally mixed. So we talked about parallel and sequential lamination mixers. Parallel mixers are where you will have multiple streams focusing on to a small cross sectional area so that uh, the diffusion uh, length becomes equal to uh, uh, the actual length divided by n where n is the number of such streams and uh, sequential uh, being basically trying to go out of plane and then back in plane so that you can physically laminate the flows together uh, and uh, therefore there are uh, there is a reduction in the diffusion time by about uh, uh, 4 to the power of n minus 1 where n is the number of stages where this mixing takes place. We also tried to do some numerical examples, designed a y shaped mixer, found out what is the length uh, of the macro channel, micro channel for the mixing to be spontaneous and uh, proper. We also designed a meandering micro mixer and uh, reduced it into a small 6 mm by 6 mm area and try to define number of turns that uh, a channel of finite length would take if it comes into this particular area. Then we also talked about different uh, designs for parallel and sequential lamination mixers based on uh, this diffusion time reduction concept and uh, compared um, for a single for a uh, certain amount of mixing time ratio uh, both uh, the stages and we found out certainly that in case of sequential lamination mixers, lesser number of stages are needed in, uh, in comparison to uh, that in the case of parallel lamination mixer for proper mixing. Okay. So let us look at uh, today a little more of experimental uh, microfluidics and I would like to discuss a small example uh, here which is uh, uh, actually performed by graduate students and uh, essentially uh, star students starting new in this area were kind of left astounded by the counterintuitive nature of the microflows um, and uh, definitely they are much much way way beyond uh, uh, the, the concepts that you can have from the macro scale mixing or macro scale turbulence uh, driven phenomena. So here uh, in this design experiment we were supposed to design a, a three layered mixer with a glass layer at the bottom okay, as you can see here and this glass layer has been drilled with uh, some uh, holes uh, so that you can have these holes for inlets and outlets uh, of the fluid. You have another layer at the top of it which is actually a PDMS layer with uh, a T section channel as you can see here in the top view illustrated in the top view and here uh, there is uh, some sort of a continuous layer of PDMS at the top of these channels uh, so that they are covered okay they are replicated on the lower surface of the PDMS and uh, this then is bonded to this glass layer okay. Uh, then further you have another layer where uh, you have these uh, blisters okay uh, the third layer and uh, in this particular layer again you have a certain thickness of PDMS over the blisters. The blisters as can be demonstrated are represented here are actually air pockets and uh, this further is bonded back into 
the top of the first PDMS layer. Okay, so you have a three layered or a stack of three layer devices and uh, here what you do is you use these ports for feeding in and out uh, the fluid flow and uh, essentially uh, you feed these particular ports here to inflate and deflate the air blisters so that you can actually compress these channels on both ends here as you can see here in this particular figure. So here as you see there are these two blister valves which would actually regulate the flow coming from these two inlets input 1 and input 2 and the idea is that these two one may be dye one may be water and they may be mixing along this output here uh, of the stream or outlet of the stream they will be mixing along this, uh, this particular zone uh, of the stem of a tea and in this particular tea again you have an area which is unknown and the idea was that the students uh, in this particular experiment were supposed to design uh, certain features and structures in this area so that they could promote quick and rapid mixing in this particular architecture. So several designs were proposed at uh, uh, the first instance by the students and the four most prominent designs which were proposed are tube bank like structures where basically there would be small pits in this uh, particular area and this would be corresponding to small pillars of the PDMS which you get replicated which gets replicated on the top of this. So uh, this was one uh, illustration where uh, this uh, central area here is uh, introduced with uh, this kind of a feature or a structure uh, and, and the flows go from the arms of the T and mix along this particular area which is also along the stem of the T. Similarly uh, here if you see in this particular example uh, you have uh, uh, let us say uh, flows coming from both ends here and mixing along this circular area which is essentially made up of small small triangular pieces of resist and uh, if, you, if you just uh, uh, do the replication on the top of this it becomes triangular pieces of PDMS pillars on the, uh, on the top surface of the reservoir uh, which is he shown here in this particular example. Okay. Uh, the third design was a figure 8 type of uh, system where uh, there would be repeated amount of mixing um, and split ups of the flow. So you have flow 1 and 2 coming from both these directions and they would mix and they would split up again and then again mix and so on and so forth. So this is a figure 8 kind of design and then in the fourth design uh, the students planned a meandering shaped micro mixer where they would have all this uh, fluid go length uh, wise side by side with a certain interfacial area along a bigger track which is defined by this meandering channel between the small uh, region on the stem of the T. So all these four designs were investigated for uh, mixing effects a flow sense dye was used from one end and it was gravity fed the idea was which was given in the constraint that uh, you should have the flow sources elevated to about 25 centimeters which means uh, that a pressure of equal to 2.45 kilopascals is to be generated and uh, after flowing this kind of a pressure driven flow through these uh, micro channels the following results came and they were really really counter intuitive. So when you actually use these uh, structures uh, whether it is the tube bank kind of structure or the triangular type uh, you have uh, really as you see here the fluorescence dye and the water flowing parallelly. What is interesting to observe here is that although there are a lot of these uh, small small uh, PDMS pillars around which the fluid should rotate and it should create local vortices or eddies they are too small to cause any mass transport particularly across the interfacial layer. So even though there exists some eddies some vortices away from the interface they are not significant to contribute any kind of mass transport across uh, the two layers and therefore until and unless you really start operating the blisters and block one flow at a time and uh, try to move this cross section as you are seeing here in this case uh, the flow line with the die has been pinched and so the flow of the die has reduced to one side and similarly when the other uh, inverse effect is done with the water line pinched the, the die would uh, try to go. So it switch past the interface switches past in a very serpentine like manner uh, as you actually try to open and close uh, the dye and the water one at a time uh, through this automated blister set 
and that does result in some amount of mixing although not very appropriate. So, uh, the, the take home message here for the, for the experiment was that even though you have uh, structures and features which would cause the eddies to develop, they would be too far away from the interface or there would not be much significant effect of these eddies and vortices away from the interface to cause the mass transport between the two streams. So, a uh, couple of things here uh, to be mentioned, one is the flow velocity at the exit uh, is roughly about 2.84 millimeters per second, that is how it was defined and corresponding to that the Reynolds number was really, really low about 0 0.00186. So, this is without valving and this is uh, with valving. The other two designs also were evaluated, the figure 8 type design um, basically would be something like a, a parallel lamination mixer and as we all know uh, for in the case of parallel lamination mixer the time nu would be actually equal to 1 by n square times of old time right and n and 2 in this case and uh, d essentially in this case is about 10 to the power of minus 4 it being a fluid ok. Uh, so, if you see here this kind of illustrates how these uh, fluorescent dyes would behave with water. Uh, you can see there is some portion of the dye a stream of dye which actually goes in here in the second illustration uh, and similarly uh, we find that there is a component of water which goes in in this second illustration here. The new diffusion time after splitting is about uh, some numerical constant k times about 10 to the power of 4 uh, seconds ok. Uh, in this particular case it is much much greater than uh, the residence time of the two streams k has been calculated to be about 3 to 4 seconds in our particular case. So, uh, there, uh, there is no mixing though, but then there is a lamination effect which is created and there is some streaks of dye which goes into the water side and some streaks of water which goes into the dye side particularly in the second junction, uh, which is pretty much what we expect in case of a parallel lamination mixer. The only design which worked in our case in this particular experiment was the serpentine design, you can see this design here although I do not do not have uh, the mixing illustrations uh, in this particular slide. But then what effectively we observed here is that uh, the int, uh, there would be an interaction between the green dye and water if you pass it through a serpentine length and one of the reasons that is so is because uh, we think that the interfacial area which is also proportional to the mass transport at a constant flux of diffusion uh, being more in this case because of more length of the serpentine would promote uh, a mass transport uh, rapidly uh, between the two flowing streams ok. And this rapidity uh, of mass transport continues for a longer time because of the meandering shape and the long length of the channel. So, you are actually trying to recite the flows for a longer time, so that this uh, overall interfacial area uh, gets significantly higher. And uh, we did see some mixing at this end here uh, in this particular kind of illustration or design. So, some uh, other examples, uh, this uh, has been quoted from this paper for, by René et al uh, from Purdue who talks about how you can actually introduce novel structures uh, in order to promote mixing. Here as you can see there is a, a small amount of fluid being uh, kind of taken away from this flow path uh, and being put into the next zone here as laminates or bands ok. And uh, as, as you go along this is really a very rapid uh, form of micro mixing that can happen ok. So, uh, although in all these uh, structures, uh, novel structures using these uh, different uh, concepts from hydrodynamics, uh, the mixing principle is really, really only diffusion ok. Uh, this is another example by Jaeger et al, uh, which talks about the separation uh, or particle separation just by using a microfluidic setup without any filtration mechanism here uh, or without any membrane. So, here uh, the concept is very, very simple as we know the diffusion length x square that a molecule would traverse is also proportional to the diffusion time and the constant of proportionality is 2 d where d is the diffusion constant. So, uh, the, if you really calculate the value of d, uh, it uh, depends on uh, several factors like uh, the size of the molecule ok, the viscosity of the medium and uh, this KBT is basically uh, Boltzmann constant into uh, temperature T of uh, the particular medium. And so, if suppose diffusion constant is given in this manner 
and you have uh, a diffusion constant higher in case of one species and lower in case of the other species then uh, by virtue of equality here uh, the distances that it may have to move would be much higher in the same kind of time okay and so therefore uh, the velocity of a heavier molecule uh, the one with diffusion coefficient more uh, i mean the velocity of the molecule with a higher diffusion coefficient is definitely more okay uh, also uh, interesting is the fact that lighter the molecule is or lesser the size of the molecule more would be the diffusion coefficient so biotin in this case is much much smaller in comparison to albumin which both of them are proteins essentially and so uh, because of its uh, uh, smaller size the diffusion constant in case of biotin is about 350 micrometers square per second in comparison to albumin which is about 65 micrometers square per second so about one fifth uh, so the size effectively is also about five times in case of albumin so smaller molecules diffuse faster that is a very na natural uh, tendency and uh, this effect can be in principle used for separation how let's say you have uh, two fluids here this is a buffer solution which you are running through this particular channel and uh, there is also uh, some kind of a uh, you know a mixed solution which you are running here uh, essentially from this end and the idea is that as the flow goes past this uh, the there is a phase separation because the idea is that uh, the heavier molecule will not be that mobile in comparison to lighter molecule lighter molecule here as we assume would diffuse towards this end actually okay will flow in this direction and so assuming that to happen the ones which are left behind in this yellow region as you can see are the heavier molecules so the heavier molecules typically go out where the lighter molecules can be separated and can be extracted as carried by or transported by this buffer at this particular end so uh, therefore smaller particles uh, diffusing further will kind of get separated from the stream by virtue of uh, a higher diffusion constant or a higher velocity in comparison to the smaller size particle. So you can use these mechanisms really for particle separation okay. Another imp interesting example of where what microfluidics can do uh, comes from this paper by uh, Bitensky et al where they talk about a biomimeric auto separation of leukocytes. Leukocytes are uh, uh, if you compare the sizes are, are pretty uh, much you know higher in size or diameter than uh, the most abundant species inside the human blood that is red blood cells. If you look at uh, really human blood contains a plasma, plasma is again bunch of uh, ions uh, present in a solution this is a liquid plasma so you have different salts and waters uh, about proteins 52 to 57 percent by volume uh, which is uh, immersed or immersed species in this plasma are platelets which are about 250,000 to 400,000 per millimeter cube of blood, leukocytes which are about uh, 5,000 to 10,000 per millimeter cube of blood and this is about 1 percent by volume again and erythrocytes or red blood cells which are about 5,000,000 to 6,000,000 per millimeter cube of blood and about 42 to 47 percent by volume. So what you are seeing here is that blood is really a very diverse component with a lot of different sizes of these cells whether it is red blood cells or leukocytes which are flowing around and so therefore can we really use microfluidic uh, principles for separating uh, the blood flow. So as you know uh, as we have been talking about before that there is a parabolic flow profile which develops in channels uh, which have fixed or static walls on both sides and the flow within is driven by a pressure gradient a constant pressure gradient. So let us suppose you have a parabolic profile uh, so you have a channel here and you have a parabolic profile like this. So obviously it means that more towards the center the velocity would be more and uh, there would be a zero velocity or a zero slip on both ends. So therefore from side to center the V should actually continuously reduce okay. And uh, if suppose you have a case where you are flowing through this end through a pressure driven flow uh, a bunch of different cells immersed in a solution one uh, which is bigger another which is smaller what do you think will happen the bigger cells would try to move towards the edges by the principle of conservation of momentum because the velocities that they will encounter by doing so the edges are, are much smaller in nature in comparison to the velocities at the center. So automatically by the principle of conservation of momentum there would be uh, a tendency of these bigger cells to kind of marginate towards the sides smaller cells to come towards the center. 
there is actually a principle which happens inside the human body also particularly for leukocytes this uh, principle is known as leukocyte margination because of smaller, uh, smaller sizes of the capillary uh, and, and the flow of different constituents using a pressure driven flow the pressure is created by the heart by the by within the human vasculature system and uh, because it is a pressure driven flow there is a tendency of the leukocytes to marginate by virtue of their sizes and go more towards the edges of the vasculature and in comparison to the red blood cells which kind of get accumulated more towards the center. So, if I can actually biomimetically represent this in terms of a micro channel let us say like this and then we pull out different branches of these micro channels let us say this is a branch which we are pulling out here at this particular end. So, uh, you have to ensure though that this has a size based selection and it only selects the size of the nuclear leukocytes. So, uh, the size of this channel is pretty much that of the leukocytes. So, what would happen is that these leukocytes which have already marginated you can see these by these white cells here and uh, they are more abundant uh, towards the side uh, than in the somewhere in the center and, and of course, the red blood cells are more abundant towards the center. So, you can actually pull this out by uh, designing a channel which is of the same size as this leukocyte is and so you can make leukocyte rich samples by uh, this kind of a this kind of a separator ok. Uh, there are lot of uh, uses for this uh, uh, this technology normally leukocytes are separated uh, from the human blood by a process called a buffy coat process where you use a density gradient causing agent like fecal plaque to uh, kind of make a density of different sizes of the cells ok within a solution. Or uh, this is a assay which can actually replicate that buffy coat process which is too intensive. Uh, both in terms of labor as well as in terms of as well as contamination prone. So, here uh, with the small assay you could have a rapid throughput where you can get really a leukocyte rich sample towards the end collection here in this particular case of the smaller channel you could investigate that for further uh, purposes. So, these are some of the wonders that microfluidics can do uh, to, uh, to different systems and processes. So, I would like to now actually uh, go into um, a, a little different domain of micro valves. Uh, when we are talking about uh, microfluidics a very important mechanism that we must ascertain is uh, control of fluidic flow and uh, for doing that we need to design different valving systems which can actually stop or block or gate the flows running past the small channels or capillaries and also we would be able to meter or control the flows uh, in the flow rates that we deserve desire uh, in certain sections of a particular microchip. So, micro valves are definitely uh, used for those purposes they are one of the most important components of a microfluidic system. So, what all uh, is important for valve designing you have to consider uh, the size of the device these MEMS devices are very very small you have to consider uh, uh, pressures which are very very high that is why most of the pressure sources sometimes are off chip ok the mechanisms of valving involves energy sources or pressure sources which are not on the same chip. Uh, we should be aware of biocompatibility issues if we are designing valve materials or choosing valve materials. Uh, the valve should have a proper response to the flow processes and most importantly uh, micro technology uh, should be used for fabricating such uh, micro valves uh, particularly for using or gating the flows in micro scale ok. So, valves uh, can again be uh, depending on the mechanism of their closing or um, working um, can be classified into passive or active micro valves ok. So, passive valves can be like check valves where uh, uh, by virtue of a change in property of a material maybe uh, it swells and blocks the valve swells and blocks or uh, alternately by motion of fluid uh, let us say you have a one directional valve from one side to another or the pressure generated from one side to another the valve closes one side automatically and opens when this pressure reverses back to the other side. So, they are passive valves ok where there is no mechanical energy or any other form of energy which are used for operating these, these valves. So, they are like check valves ok passive valves are normally a part of micro pump ok. We will study this micro pump topic in more detail later. So, active valves on the other hand are essentially those uh, which are dominated by uh, 
the some kind of energy input to the valving system. So, an active valve is, is a pressure containing mechanical device uh, normally used to modify the flow or stop the flow or seize the flow. Um, although it can be mechanical as well as non mechanical, there may be instances where you can use uh, electronically uh, to close a particular channel or electrochemically to close or gate a particular channel. And we will actually consider some of these illustrations and designs later on where we design these uh, different valving techniques. So, the working state of a valve really uh, as you can see here is determined by a closure element or the valve seat over which this closure element would typically sit for the valving to be on uh, and this is driven by an actuator. Okay. So, that is how the, the valving process can be done in case of micro valves. Okay. So, some of these uh, micro valves again uh, can uh, based on what their initial states are whether they are normally open valves or normally closed valves can be classified into these two subtypes okay, or uh, uh, a bistable uh, valve which can close and open uh, actively uh, their valve seats. So, you have three categories here normally closed where valve normally after actuation opens up normally open where the valve actually is normally open, but it closes on actuation and bistable which can also which, which can actually close and open both on some active energy being pumped in, in the valve valving system on the valve seats. So, valves can further uh, control flows either in an analog manner or a digital manner which means digital is just an off and on kind of mechanism. You have uh, the fluid flowing at one instance and not flowing at another instance. Uh, whereas, in analog mechanisms it is uh, actually a slow closure of the valve and slow decrease in the flow rate across a valve uh, and vice versa. So, you can categorize them into uh, an analog way and a digital way. So, as I illustrated that in an analog valve at constant inlet pressure the valve actuator varies the spacing between the valve seat and the valve opening and this changes the fluidic resistance and thus the flow rates. So, it is a analog control on the rates. On the digital mode however, there are only two valve states fully open and fully closed. Okay. Uh, it can be operated in a pulse uh, actually with pulse with modulation technology and uh, here the open time is uh, controlled and as the flow can be varied proportionally to what the open time is. So, essentially if you look at some of these uh, output responses this is again what an analog valve would typically look like this is the discharge rate uh, versus time plot of that. So, with time as you see as the valve is fully open the flow rate is maximum and it now closes and the flow rate goes down slowly, but then there is an analog response. So, there is a slow um, convergence of the flow rate to a maximum and a slow convergence of the flow rate again to a minimum. It is not a rapid uh, one shot close and open phenomena. This is a digital uh, micro valve again where you have only two states the close of the open and then the interconnection between this is really very very small in time. So, you do not need uh, much opening time or closing time it automatically either opens or closes. So, here this is a normally open uh, system this is a normally closed system okay. this is a normally closed this is a normally open system. And uh, by pulse width modulation what you mean is you can actually use uh, this technology to vary the flow uh, according to your own interest. So, if you have more open time here as you are seeing the small loops that this discharge is formulating is the open time. Okay. So, this is a smaller open time this is this is a slightly larger open time this is a slightly uh, this is the largest open time and similarly these are the closure times the time for which the valves are closed and you can see there are all different times of closures. So, pulse width modulation basically would mean that if you have the pulse width uh, to be more uh, in case uh, in this particular case uh, you have um, uh, the flow going on for a longer amount of time. So, pulse width modulation effectively therefore, means that if you increase the open time the flow rate would be more if you reduce the open time the flow rate would be less and that way you can have a differential flow rate okay, Q with respect to T. So, active micro valves again are characterized on the basis of their actuation principles uh, the actuation can be uh, or actuation actually means the, the way that you are delivering the energy. You can actuate a micro valve pneumatically 
<coughs> you can do that thermodynamically, uh, thermomechanically. You can also use a piezoelectric crystal to actuate a microvalve. You could use an electrostatic method for uh, microvalve actuation, electromagnetic, electrochemical, capillary force, surface tension, all different kind of forms can be used for actually closing and opening a valve uh, system. So, if we look at some uh, aspects of uh, micro valves and the way that you have to specify or characterize these systems, you have different uh, parameters which you use for uh, finding out the performance criteria of such valves. One is the leakage ratio. Okay. So, the leakage ratio essentially can be represented as the flow rate of the closed system divided by the, system, okay. so the flow rate of the open system. So, this is the fully open mode what is the flow rate and this is the fully closed mode what is the flow rate. So, there is a ratio between what is the flow rate at the closed mode uh, uh, in respect to what is the flow rate at the open mode. So, basically uh, this kind of represents the, the how what kind of leakages the valve would have this ratio is more than 0 that means definitely in the uh, the closed mode the valve is leaky uh, there is some flow uh, which can be a fraction of the fully open flow okay and uh, that fraction effectively cannot uh, be done away with and the valve would still be in, in its fullest operating and its most stringent operating condition would be able to uh, uh, let this flow past it or through it. So, that is what leakage ratio would mean. Okay. Uh, this is q dot closed is flow rate with the valve closed and q dot open is the flow rate with the valve the pressure head that is actually driving uh, the flow through this valve okay or the, or the under root of uh, or the square root of the pressure head that is driving through uh, this particular valve let's illustrate this a little properly so uh, so therefore valve capacity c let's say of the valve is defined as q star maximum this is the maximum flow rate uh, divided by root of delta p uh, maximum which is the pressure difference across the valve uh, divided by rho g rho is uh, the density g is the acceleration to gravity. So, therefore, this really is a indication of what is the pressure height what is the height available you know uh, causing the pressure gradient what is the height of uh, pressure that is available across both both ends of the valve. And uh, so, the ratio between the maximum flow rate times uh, and, and the root of this particular available height is what makes uh, uh, these uh, the, the capacity or what defines the capacity of the valve. So, therefore, if the if the pressure head that can be withstand withstood by the system is more the valve capacity is lower um, and vice versa if the pressure head that can be withstand by this system is higher uh, the, the valve capacity um, is higher. Okay. So, uh, so, the closing force depends on uh, the pressure generated pressure range generated by uh, the particular actuator sequence here in this particular illustration you can see some of the different actuation mechanisms and the way uh, that pressure can be the pressure range can be generated uh, by different actuator mechanisms. So, here for example, uh, Okay, so let me just write these things down. Q dot max is maximum flow rate. Delta P max is maximum pressure drop. Rho is the fluid density. G, of course, as you know, is the acceleration due to gravity. So, for electromagnetic disk type piezoelectric electrostatic and electrochemical actuation the pressure ranges that can be generated by this actuator in roughly about 1 to 10 kilo Pascals. If you go a little bit higher uh, to pneumatic thermoneumatic shape memory alloy based and thermomechanical 
uh, actuators, uh, the pressure ranges would be in the range of about 100 to 1000 kilopascals. And the highest pressure range that can be actuated is given by the stack type piezoelectric crystal, but there are multiple piezoelectrics which are stacked one on another and the effective uh, pressure that is felt is a result of the series pressure of all these different piezo crystals uh, taken together and uh, here the, uh, the actuation pressure uh, uh, can be as high as about 10,000 kilopascals. Okay. So, that is what uh, essentially um, the, the valve capacity would characterize. So, therefore, what it means is that the maximum flow rate which it can hold per unit uh, pressure head available uh, is what the capacity is. The, so, therefore, uh, if suppose uh, the pressure head is uh, let us say fixed and you have a valve which can hold uh, uh, let us say 1 centimeter cube per minute of flow rate another which can hold 10 times this value. So, 10 centimeter cube per minute uh, flow rate. So, for a similar kind of pressure head uh, on both ends uh, you know C valve or the valve capacity uh, would be much more in case of the 10 centimeter cube per minute uh, flow closing valve in comparison to the 1 centimeter cube per minute flow closing valve. So, that is what uh, valve capacity is characterized as. So, there are some other uh, performance factors uh, which include what kind of power is consumed uh, by the system, okay. what are the closing forces in terms of pressure ranges which you need for the valve to fully close, uh, what kind of temperature ranges you can use the valve in. So, these are some of the specifications if you design such valves. What is the response time? It is a big criteria, how quickly the valve can open and close a uh, particular flow. Uh, is there any reliability issue or uh, the valve operation is perfectly unique or not every time uh, or repetitive or not every time uh, is what is a very important design paradigm. Biocompatibility aspect itself of the material is a very uh, major concept which is important for designing or selection of materials which would make these micro valves. And then finally, chemical compatibility again is a, is a highly, highly uh, important parameter for designing the specifications of these micro valves. Let us do some uh, uh, now some real examples of valve designing to see a little more of how uh, this, this can really be uh, designed for flow systems. So, uh, so, the power consumption of the valve really is uh, the total input power of the valve in its active power consuming state and uh, it may be small for electrochemical valves and very large for thermonumeric valves depending on what is the actuation mechanism and how. It, uh, the things can be actuated. So, in this particular example here, we want to design a pneumatic micro valve system. So, let us suppose, so uh, let us uh, now solve this example of designing a pneumatic valve system. So, we have a pneumatic micro valve here which has a circular silicon membrane. So, this right here is the membrane uh, which is circular as seen in the top view, this is the side view, the cross sectional side view actually. So, the silicon membrane essentially is the valve seat in this particular valve which means that if the silicon membrane kind of bends and deforms like this, it kind of blocks uh, the particular valve. Okay. Uh, the valve seat is actually uh, just below uh, this membrane. So, normally it is flat, it bends and blocks uh, the entry of the air flow into the system. So, the membrane is about 20 microns thick, and it has a diameter of about 4 mm. 4000 microns and the valve is normally open. Okay. So, there is uh, no pressure over uh, this particular region here and uh, it is as if the valve is uh, open at the very outset. Okay. And uh, the gap in that particular case is about another 20 microns uh, between the membrane and the valve inlet. So, you have to determine uh, the pressure required for closing the valve at an inlet pressure of about 1 bar as you can see here. The opening diameter is 200 microns which is uh, right here. So, we have to assume that uh, uh, the load is distributed on the valve membrane uh, and there is a Poisson's ratio of about 0 0.25 uh, and there is a bulk Young's modulus uh, of silicon which is about 100. 70 giga Pascal. So, we have to design the system. So, let us actually look at how uh, we will design this. So, for a small deflection uh, 
Now the spring constant of the valve membrane can be estimated as k equal to 16 pi e tube by 3 square minus 1 minus nu square. Now, this comes from a simple beam theory uh, and any standard mechanics of solids textbook uh, would be able to demonstrate how uh, the spring constant in case of thin beams can be reported. Okay. So the various parameters are uh, E is the Young's modulus. T is the member thickness, the member which is deforming and is really the valve. R is the radius of the member. Nu is the Poisson's ratio. So, we have pretty much everything among this. So, let us calculate what the k value would be. It is equal to 16 pi times of E which is 170 10 to the power of 9. Well, the Young's modulus for silicon is 170 giga Pascals. So, this Pascals times of thickness cube. So, it is 20 10 to the power minus 6 20 microns is the thickness uh, of the particular member in question. So, cube of thickness divided by 3 r cube r is basically 4000 microns uh, or 2000 microns. So, it is about 2 10 to the power of minus 3 meters cube of this times of 1 minus uh, I am sorry square of this uh, times of 1 minus nu square nu is 0 0.25 Poisson's ratio. Uh, so, this comes out to be effectively equal to 6.08 in 10 to the power of 3 Newton per meter that is what the k value is. So, let us assume that the micro valve is closed at uh, an actuation pressure of P A C T. So, let us assume on the micro valve is closed at P act actuation pressure. Okay. So, the force balance equation for this valve because it is a distributed load is basically the actuation pressure which is actually from this side as you see here this is the p actuation okay and this is the p inlet all right so you are left with p actuation times of area of membrane times of uh, p inlet times of area of the open system so essentially uh, in this case the open system is nothing but uh, the area of the membrane itself again. So, P H P input times of A open okay, plus the spring force. Mind you the pressure here is actually uh, being resisted by this uh, downward spring like movement of this valve. So, whatever force this uh, P input would have on the membrane plus the force spring is essentially equal to the actuation pressure times the area of uh, the particular membrane. So, this is uh, essentially at equilibrium. This is at equilibrium. Okay. This right here is an equilibrium. So, this right here again is the A open the area of cross section which is open. So, equilibrium means that the membrane is fully seated over the, uh, the inlet hole 
thus valving the flow and uh, A open is the area of the inlet hole, P input is the inlet pressure and uh, that plus the, the spring force is essentially equal to the force by the actuation pressure on the other side of the membrane. Just about when the actuation begins. this equation slightly modifies. So, you have now P act times of m on one side which is also equal to P in times of a m on the same membrane because it is in the open position plus the f spring. The spring force is still there okay, when uh, actuation just about begins. Okay. Sorry, already written this thing back on the top when the actuation just about begins as you can see here. Okay. So, let us actually calculate uh, some of these values, uh, let us see what happens when the actuation begins. So, you have P actuation, actuation pressure needed is P inlet plus F spring times 1 by A m, A m essentially is pi r square, r is about 2000 micrometers and so therefore, uh, the actuation pressure would be 10 to the power of 5 Pascals, uh, so the pressure in uh, the inlet side is about close to 1 bar which is nothing but 10 to the power 5 Pascals as uh, you know plus uh, the force spring which is 6.08 10 to the power 3 times of the deflection which is again about 20 10 to the power of minus 6 uh, that is essentially the 20 micron displacement that would happen here as you see. Okay. Uh, let us assume that the port has not yet blocked and uh, the pressure is released onto the entire lower surface of the seat membrane and this divided by A m which is pi r square, r is 2 10 to the power of minus 3 square. So, this value comes out to be about 109,677 Pascals. Now, when at equilibrium though uh, this entirely this paradigm changes. So, when at equilibrium the P actuation needed would be much much lesser more so because now uh, the active area over which this one bar pressure is available is only this little area here that is the P uh, the area of uh, the opening. Okay. So, let us see what that would be. Uh, force spring in this particular case is again k times of 20 10 to the power minus 6 and uh, p actuation times of pi times of sorry p actuation times of pi times of uh, 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 square would effectively be equal to 10 to the power 5 times of pi times of 0 0.1 10 to the power of minus 3 square plus 6.08 10 to the power 3 times of 20 times of 10 to the power of minus 6 and p actuation here would come out to be effectively equal to 3.1 okay so let me just write down the final value here so it comes out to be about 9581 pascals So, in comparison to the earlier value here which was about close to 109,677 Pascals, this has reduced to almost 2 orders of magnitude and become about 9581 Pascals. So, why that is so again? Because uh, when the valve is open the area of membrane or the area of inlet pressure or area available to the inlet pressure is the full lower area of the membrane. Okay. And uh, when the valve is closed, 
Now, the area available is only the inlet or the or the opening of the piping. inlet piping. So, that is primarily the reason why the actuation pressure in the second case where the valve is closed is much much lower in comparison to the actuation pressure in the upper case. This is uh, though an advantage because being at the micro scale the area of cross section of such valves is very very small and so effectively the amount of uh, force that is generated by the inlet side by design. Uh, which is also pressured into area by virtue of the area being very small uh, remains uh, small and uh, it necessitates uh, a lower amount of actuation pressure. So, therefore, in case of pneumatic valves uh, in this kind of configuration it is always desired to make uh, the, the inlet side opening as small as possible which can rhyme with the micro systems and that can uh, help us uh, to have lower amount of actuation pressures to control uh, the valving action. If we design the same valve with a thermonumeric perspective that means uh, uh, whatever this uh, load distributed load here was obtained okay, on this particular membrane uh, is done through heating um, some kind of a gas entrapped over the membrane. Uh, and so, so, that is called a thermonumeric system. So, therefore, uh, on a fixed volume if you actually keep on adding electrical work or energy there is an expansion of the gas which would cause a pressure to develop and the pressure would be good enough for the membrane to bend and uh, valve the, the inflow of the air. And so, those systems are known as typically thermo pneumatic systems. So, for a similar kind of arrangement uh, let us see what would be the amount of uh, temperature that is needed to be reached for uh, sufficient amount of actuation force to be gen pressure to be generated. So, that the a closing action of the valve takes place. So, let us suppose you have uh, the valve described in the earlier example and uh, this is designed with a thermonumeric actuator on the top of the membrane and it is given that the actuator chamber is cylinder with a height of about 500 microns and this is sitting on a diameter of about 400 microns which is also the outside diameter of the valve. Uh, the silicon membrane valve uh, uh, which is in consideration right now. So, if the chamber is filled with air and uh, hermetically sealed uh, we have to determine the temperature required for closing the valve at an inlet pressure of about 1 bar and uh, the initial pressure and temperatures uh, in the chamber are 1 bar and 27 degrees Celsius. So, again we use the Charles law and on a fixed volume you have pressure uh, kind of proportional to the temperature. So, therefore, uh, T 1 by T 2 means temperature in the beginning by temperature after the expansion has taken place is pressure 1 by pressure 2. So, uh, assuming the, the volume of the chamber is constant. So, here uh, of course, the pressure inlet pressure is about 1 bar uh, and uh, uh, we found out that uh, the amount of pressure that is needed from the actuation pressure that is needed from the opening to the closing position. Uh, or opening position is about 109,677 pascals. Okay, so this is uh, the P1 which is needed, and uh, the inlet pressure P2 is about one bar, which is about 100,000. And uh, so therefore, if uh, the inlet pressure one bar is at 27 degrees Celsius temperature, which is about corresponding to about 300 Kelvin. Uh, we find out from this relationship that T 2 or the temperature required for the pressure to be 109,677 Pascals is about 329 Kelvin which is close to 56 degrees Celsius. So, therefore, you have to really heat uh, the constant volume of the cylinder with a height of 5000 5, microns 500 microns by to almost about 56 degrees for uh, the, uh, the valve to self close using thermonumeric means. So, that is how you design a thermonumeric uh, valving system. Okay. So, there can be also passive valves as I uh, uh, 
recorded last uh, in my last lecture and these passive valves essentially are based on either uh, the expansion of a structure blocking of flow because of this expansion etc. So, these uh, valves are very beautifully illustrated by uh, Bebe et al in this particular paper uh, poured in PNAS where he used hydrogels and essentially as you see here these hydrogels are uh, fixed to certain fixed members in a flow channel. So, direction of flow being from direction A to direction B through this channel. So, typically these are unexpanded and you have a gap in between here from where the flow can go from A side to B side, but uh, hydrogels are essentially things which uh, ex expand or swell on different pHs particularly when the pH is more like acidic uh, the valves would swell uh, in volume ok. So, it will be expand. So, if you have these valves expanding in volume they become this big uh, and uh, by virtue of their size they can block the flow ok. So, now the flow is blocked because these hydrogels have kind of swelled and uh, they are blocking the flow direction in this particular channel. As a result of which uh, these, uh, these valves uh, can be very good pH sensors. So, small change in pH can result in uh, a swelling and flow stoppage of the particular valve and you can calibrate the change of pH to the to the volume of uh, swelling or the, or the volume difference that would that the valve would make by swelling uh, and and therefore the volume of flow uh, past the valve can be calibrated to uh, the corresponding pH so uh, here of course uh, as as you uh, are seeing you can reversibly change the orientation by flowing back uh, a basic pH so that the valve kind of shrinks and gives way or opens uh, uh, the flow and these uh, being made up of hydrogel and soft materials they can be biomimetically patterned they are based on some of the flow valves that our heart probably possesses where expansion and contraction uh, keeps on either confining the blood onto the chamber of the heart or releasing the blood at a certain pressure. So, uh, this kind of brings us to an end of uh, this particular lecture and next lecture we, uh, we are going to talk about some other valving mechanisms particularly non-conventional mechanisms like electrochemical uh, or surface driven uh, valving or, or flow closing mechanisms. So, with this I would like to close this lecture, thank you.